The plot thickens after four episodes of the final season of Picard, and it only gets more intense from here. So continue to join us each week as we explore every episode and go through all the details you may have missed. And please stay tuned to the end to get a special look inside this episode directly from the mouth of showrunner Terry Metalis himself. So you don't want to miss this episode. Can we talk? Officially, no. Unofficially? No. And stay tuned until later where we'll be showing you a futuristic wallet Starfleet would be proud of, even though they don't need money. Once you have their money, you never give it back. Exactly. Last week's episode ended with the Titan being disabled by its own weapons fire and sinking into the nebula's gravity well. We learned that a faction of terrorist changelings wouldn't accept defeat in the Dominion War and is now planning something big. Picard suffered parenthood trial by fire when Jack nearly died in sickbay. Some of the things we hope to learn from this episode include what was really stolen from Daystrom now that we know the portal weapon was a distraction. How did a changeling infiltrate the Titan and are there more? And will the Titan find a way out of what looks like certain doom? This is the end, my friend. We begin five years ago, and we are back in Guinan's bar. We see a die-cast model of the Enterprise C, whose only appearance was in the TNG episode Yesterday's Enterprise. We then see a painting of Picard when he was a much younger captain on the Enterprise D. I Can't Break Away From That Girl by Slam Allen is playing, and Picard is about to have something to eat when several Starfleet cadets approach his table and want to ask him questions about his career. They specifically mention his encounter with the Herogen. The Herogen are a species of hunters who first appear in Star Trek Voyager. They are known for their hunting prowess and their philosophy that hunting is the highest form of honor and discipline. And of course they ask if Admiral Janeway gave him any advice because she was the captain that first came into contact with the Herogen. Picard decides to spontaneously give a stirring speech to the cadets in which he says as long as they and their crews stay steadfast in their dedication to each other. You are never, ever without hope. This is truly what Star Trek is about. The flashback ends and we are back on the Titan, which is falling deeper into the nebula's gravity well. Captain Riker and his bridge crew attempt to dissect the situation to find a way out. This is a fantastic moment that really connects us to the bridge crew. We already feel connected to this crew as they expertly help Riker determine the situation. In danger of losing life support, they have to divert all power from their engines, which only gives them four hours before the end. A bioelectrical wave coming from the nebula occurs, forcing them to lower their shields. Riker and Picard have a heart-to-heart -heart about the situation, and Riker tells Picard he was right before. He tells the story of Thaddeus's death. Because Will has found nothing to prove an afterlife in all of his travels, he feels empty at the loss of his son. Riker tells Jean-Luc, this, this is the end, and suggests he takes time to get to know his son and get his affairs in order. We then get to Seven, who is searching quarters looking for the Changeling. On a desk in the room, we see Tuvok's Vulcan game called Toe from the Voyager series. I think you'll find my game has improved. How did you get here? Seven finds the actual crewman, a transporter officer, dead in the closet. The Changeling was mimicking Ensign Foster, which could be a nod to Lieutenant Foster's character who appears in the Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode, The Maquis Part One. The episode also features Lieutenant Dax, who discovers evidence that a high-ranking Starfleet officer may be secretly supporting the Maquis, someone posing as an officer, to sabotage Starfleet. Seven tells Riker that the Changeling could have changed its appearance to look like anyone at this point, and Riker wants to keep it quiet. Riker tells Seven he could reinstate her, but her working in an unofficial capacity could work to their advantage, and sends Seven out to find the Changeling. Beverly seems to be timing out the bioelectrical waves, and Picard asks for some private time with Jack. We then see Seven going to Shaw to give him the bad news about the Changelings, and she tells him something big is happening and she needs him because no one knows the ship better than he does. Riker tries to record a message for Deanna in case he dies, but he can't find the words. Picard offers Jack some wine from his vineyard, but Jack tells him in a moment of levity that he's not really a wine guy. Guess he won't be taking over the family business. Whiskey? Preferably cheap and on the rocks. Jack asks why the holodeck is open, and we learn something we didn't know before. But before we share you a secret about the holodeck that is new to Star Trek, let me quickly tell you about this video's sponsor, Exter. 
who makes what we believe is the best wallet ever created. We just threw away our old wallets. Wanna know why? Because we just discovered the most efficient smart wallet in the world. Exter has revolutionized the wallet and we will never go back to Bifold. We are so impressed. Exter wallets are super slim and sleek. They are half the size of a conventional Bifold wallet. Compact and modular, they hold 12 cards or more plus cash. And that means no more stuffing that bulky, worn out Bifold wallet into your back pocket. Forget sitting on that uncomfortable lump and slide Exter into your front pocket instead. This high quality wallet combines Italian leather, space grade aluminum, and carbon fiber. Plus, it includes built-in RFID blocking to protect you from wireless theft. And you know how hard it can be to replace all of your cards if your wallet is stolen. Exter includes a tracking card to help you keep an eye on your belongings with a map, and you can even ring it for location assistance. This is the last wallet you'll ever buy. To get an extra wallet like ours, visit shop.exter.com slash thepopcast. Get 25% off your order when you use code thepopcast at checkout. Join the wallet revolution and upgrade your quality of life with Exter today. The ninth rule of acquisition clearly states that opportunity plus instinct equals profit. We all know the holodeck is a place for recreation while being out among the stars for months at a time. But did you know it's also a place crew members can go in times of distress? Picard explains to Jack that the holodeck is kept working on low power so it can be used as a place for people to go in times of distress. It's a type of sanctuary. You can add that to Star Trek canon. Jack adds a bit of levity to the situation and wants to know when Picard lost his hair. I think we need to talk about the elephant in the room. The hair. It's a nice moment and something any son of Picard would want to know. Picard wants to know more about his son and asks him why he didn't want to know him. Jack changes the subject and instead tells Picard a story making a joke about Metallus IV being a real dump. We were on a medical supply run to Metallus IV. It's, it's, it's a vile place. A real dump which is a great inside joke for showrunner Terry Metalis. Back in Shaw's quarters, Seven and her captain go through all of the information. Shaw begins to compliment Seven, making us believe he is apologizing to her, but since that's not something he would actually say, it shows her how she might find a changeling. Yes, Shaw almost had us there. You have great instincts, you're a natural leader, you make a great captain one day. We then get an unexpected cannabis joke from Seven. I'm assuming you're not referring to cannabis. Sadly, no. As Shaw tells her to look for the pot the changelings would need to regenerate in. Steal their pot. Pot. Beverly has timed out the bioelectric waves as sick bay braces for another impact. Seven is back in the dead crewman's quarters searching for the pot and she finds it hidden in a light receptacle. Over on the Shrike, we now learn Vatic is also a changeling as she cuts off her hand and then begins to communicate with it. This is very reminiscent of a form of communication witches or Wiccans use to speak with demons or spirits for guidance. What is this, a supernatural episode? Are you actually listening to this? Sam. Are you friggin' nuts? Shut up for a second, Sam. Shut up, the both of you. The entity Vatic is communicating with demands she pursues Jack Crusher into the gravity well despite it being suicide. Pursue. The demon looking entity tells her that she, her crew, and the ship are all expendable. All that matters is retrieving the asset. The Shrike then follows them into the nebula. We return to five years earlier where Picard is finishing the story to the cadets. One of the cadets brings up his friend Jack Crusher and an incident on a shuttle with a no-win scenario. You and your friend, Jack Crusher, a uh, mishap. Now back in the present in Guinan's holodeck bar, the ship's crew come to be distracted from the coming doom. Jack tells Picard he never felt like he needed to be a part of something. He tells Picard being on the outside and alone is his thing. Jack then tells his father this isn't a moment he needs. I get that you might think that I need this. But John Luke says that it's something that he needs. I do. The changeling now in the body of another crewman destroys the pot Seven is carrying and escapes into the walls after killing another crew member. Back in the bar, Jack asks about the toughest situation Picard has been in and also Beverly's first husband, Jack, comes up. He asks if it bothers him that he was named after her ex-husband, but Jean-Luc tells him he was also his best friend and would have named him that himself. Picard tells the story about him, Jack, and the shuttle spending 10 grueling hours to find their way home. Unexpectedly, Shaw shows up and asks Jack if Picard ever told him about the time they met at the Battle of Wolf 359. 
suddenly everything gets very serious. In this moment, we finally learn what Shaw has against Picard. He was on that Borg cube, setting the world on fire! Shaw was on the USS Constance during that decimating battle that Locutus led the Borg against Starfleet. Of course, Picard had been taken unwillingly, and the Borg used his knowledge to wipe out the defensive fleet against the Borg cube. The Constance was first introduced in the Star Trek New Frontier series of books about the Titan and Excalibur ships. Shaw then tells the story that there was only one life pod, and we learn he has survivor's guilt over his friends that died when he lived because he was randomly selected to escape. 11,000 dead, Shaw says as he points at Picard and asks Jack if he knows where his father was that day. In this very serious and emotional scene, we also get a retcon of the Borg from Picard Season 2 on the Stargazer as Shaw says, Forget about all that weird shit of the Stargazer. The real Borg are still out there. This retcons the Borg for both previous seasons of Picard, as the common thought was that the Borg were all destroyed. Shaw, not finished, delivers the clever line that Locutus was the only Borg so deadly they gave him a name. The only Borg so deadly they gave him a goddamn name. All right. Jack, hearing enough, comes to Picard's aid, but Picard says, it's all right. He looks at Shaw and says, he understands, and then he leaves with Jack following. It's obvious this deeply affected Shaw, as it would anyone. Jack tells Picard he doesn't owe him an explanation. You don't need to explain yourself to me. Picard gets to Beverly, and she explains the bioelectric waves are putting them in danger. Jack suggests that they plug into the waves and ride them out of the nebula. The science here is so fantastic. It is classic Trek and exactly what we need. We learn that the nebula is actually a womb. Beverly says we've encountered species like this before, and Picard points out Farpoint, which goes all the way back to the first episode of the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation. Lock it in on Farpoint Station. Jack suggests navigating the Titan the way Picard did in his story with ex-husband Jack, and we see a smile from Beverly as she recognizes a connection growing between her son and Jean-Luc. Riker fights against the suggestions, obviously in the middle of an existential crisis, but Beverly reels him back in and says Deanna would say it's about trust, all of us together. Jean-Luc delivers the hopeful line, if this is the end, let's do this together, doing what we know we do best. The doubt melts off of Riker. Energized and excited, he finalizes the plan and they move into action. Riker prepares the crew and delivers a rousing speech about working together to get through this. Hang tight and work together. We're gonna get through this. Picard and Seven seek out Shaw for his help. They need an old grease monkey, and Shaw agrees to help. With only 18 minutes of life support left, Shaw is trying to rig the nacelles, and Riker gives Picard the con as he's the only one there with experience flying blind. It's awesome seeing Picard in the big chair again as he delivers his famous line, Engage. The Titan moves into position to catch the wave as Shaw and Seven work together. Suddenly, Ensign LaForge shows up to help, but Seven is ready with her phaser as she realizes she is the changeling. Seven asks her a key question. She asks her, what's her name? When LaForge says, it's Hanson, Seven kills her, and Shaw finally understands how Seven feels about her name. And just as Jack, Picard's friend, did years ago on that shuttle, Jack, his son, begins calling out the position of asteroids in the Titan's way. The symbolism about the building relationship between these two is apparent. Picard deftly maneuvers the ship out of danger, and the bridge crew is relieved. As Riker orders all power transferred from life support, the Titan goes dark and they wait for the wave. When it comes, the ship rides out of the nebula and gains their power back at the same time. The Shrike comes into picture and Vatic says, open the jaw wide enough the prey run right into the mouth of the beast. But Riker does have something waiting for her open mouth, and she doesn't see it coming. An asteroid thrown by the Titan's tractor beam disables the Shrike. With the Shrike disabled, the Titan is able to escape as we see the space babies being born from the nebula. It's a magical Star Trek moment and a reminder of life and hope. Beverly says, seek out new life, and Riker says, I think we should boldly get the hell out of here. We then hear the voice of Picard finishing his speech from five years earlier when he is talking to the cadets. He says, you are only as good as those around you. Your crew becomes a part of you, complete you. They lift you up to accomplish the things you never could do alone. We then see that Jack was behind the cadets in the bar listening the whole time. He asks Picard if he ever had a life outside of Starfleet, a real family. Picard tells him, 
Starfleet has been the only family he has ever needed, and we finally see why Jack didn't want to get to know his father. Back in the present, Picard seems to realize what he said, and you can see the regret on his face. Now safe from the nebula and the Shrike, Riker finally finds the words he has for Deanna. He calls her and tells her everything is going to be okay, that something has changed, and the birth that he witnessed has restored something inside of him. He seems to be at peace with the loss of his son, finally. And in a wonderful moment, Picard finally gives us a Starfleet log. It's great to hear. He still doesn't know who Vatic is or what she wants with his son. We then cut to Jack, who's having another vision of the vines and a voice telling him to find me. He begins hitting his head as he sees a vision of red clouds and the same door that is now opening wider. The episode ends with a female voice saying, Find me. This episode has a level of depth and emotion we would argue has not been seen in Star Trek for a long time. All of the characters are more fleshed out than we would have hoped, and the true depth of their feelings only brings us closer to them than we've ever felt before. And while our crew is currently out of trouble, we still have many questions left unanswered. What does the changeling Vatic want with Jack? Who is pushing her to pursue him? What are these visions of the vines and the door that Jack keeps having? All will be revealed as the showrunner and his team leave no stone unturned and every plot point earned. Were the last moments of this episode not the most hopeful you have felt about Star Trek in a long time? If so, give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing as we'll be doing this every week. And don't forget to pay close attention to the end credits as things here were spoilers in plain sight the whole time. You just didn't know it until now. And stay tuned because in a moment we are going to share with you thoughts on episode 4 directly from the mouth of showrunner Terry Metalis. But first, what do you think? Did this episode of Star Trek Picard Season 3 lock you in for the rest of the season, or do you need to see more? Tell us what you think in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video and want to hear more discussions about this topic and others like it, please join us over at our other channel, The Popcast Unleashed, where we'll be conducting interviews with your favorite Star Trek personalities. Also, please consider supporting the channel and get your own Captain Shaw-inspired graphic design from the amazing artists at MixedTees.com. Get 20% off your purchase by using coupon code THEPOPCAST. The link is in the description below. And now, Star Trek Picard Season 3 showrunner, Terry Metalis. We thought it would be really interesting to tell the story of a former engineer who rose through the ranks of Starfleet, who was there that day. I, I, I even remember when I was a kid watching Star Trek The Next Generation, after Picard was assimilated, two episodes later, he, he's back on the bridge. Seems like a bad call for Starfleet. It seems like, you know, obviously they did a scan and he seems like they, you know, they thought he was fit for duty. And then in first contact, they sort of suggest he still has some connection to the collective. He can still hear them. So it's always been this thing in my mind that there's got to be people like Cisco who have a real resentment to this guy being this legendary captain who was also a key component to essentially Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. to uh, a surprise attack, you know, to this, 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 this horrible uh, tragedy. What better way to do it than this um, monologue by Todd Stashwick, this, this Indianapolis Robert Shaw yes. monologue um, uh, by, by, by Todd to Patrick. And he's, he's, he's just phenomenal in that scene. He was on that Borg cube, setting the world on fire!